All right. Mark here for Mark 2.0. I'm going to toss it over to Gordon to introduce our next iconic guest. Gordon, take it away. Icon iconic does not begin to describe this man's life. 1983, drafted number one, fourth overall by the Milwaukee Brewers. Pitched in the low minors, got as high as A ball, but unfortunately his arm gave out a number of surgeries and it forced him to hang up his cleats. And if you've seen Disney's movie, The Rookie, and if you haven't, you have to watch this movie. It's incredible. You get to a window into the life of our next guest. Welcome to the podcast, Jim, the Rookie Morris. Welcome, Gordon, sir. Thanks for that introduction. And Mark, I'm looking forward to this interview. Better be good. <laughs> uh, no, no pressure. No, no pressure bottom of the all, night. Bases loaded. Playoff game. Frank Thomas up. Uh, Frank yeah, Thomas right. at the plate. You just struck him out. There we go. In his MVP season, no less. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to start off with your trip. One of the things I, you know, you, you read about, I read about in the arm surgeries. I believe you had four when you, you got as high as a ball after being drafted. Yeah. And in the movie, you're depicted as a young kid, 12, 13 years old, pitching up against a chain link fence, Jimmy Morris, Game 7 World Series, which every kid has done. Right. And I had to wonder, how much were you pitching in your youth? And do you think it contributed to the arm troubles you had later on in life? Wow. Uh, absolutely. And I played first base. I caught for one batter. And I begged our coach and I said, let me catch, let me catch. Left-handers don't catch. I said, I can catch. You've seen me play in the outfield. He puts me in. I reach out for the ball. The batter swings around, hits me in the back of the head. I fall on top of the plate. And he walks out and he goes, you done? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. That's um, what... When you got dad's coaching, because you're on military teams moving around. And so when dads are in and they're not out at sea, they want to coach. And so they come up to you and they go, can you pitch? And your knuckles could be dragging the ground. You're like, oh, yeah, I can pitch. And you don't think anything of it. It's not the game. It wasn't the game then that it is now where guys have dietitians and stretching people and all this other stuff in between. And it was just you get there on your talent. And if you're good enough, you go. And if you're not, you go home. And you know, this is back in 1983 where we get to Phoenix and it's hot and we're wearing rubber tops, no weights because weights tighten up pitchers and you can't throw hard. So we're running with rubber tops on in the heat and losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. And, and then when I came back in 99, everything is about lifting and sprinting. There's no long distance running anymore. I'm like, I could do this now. And so it was a lot more fun. It was a lot more efficient and you were a lot more, you were more strong. So you could bounce back better. But back then all you did was wear and tear. You didn't do any weights to build your body back up. You just pitched and ran. And so, yeah, growing up, I threw too much. I threw when I shouldn't have, but having an abusive father like I did, who made me feel like I was an inch tall, there's no way I'm backing down in front of him. And so the, can you pitch? Yep. So too much well, too soon. Can, can you t tell us, I, I wasn't able to find out what, what were the actual arm surgeries? Are we talking Tommy John? Uh, Are we talking uh, rotator cuff? What? Yeah. Um, first year was rookie ball and they sent me an instructional league and they shut me down early because I got sore. And when I say I got sore, I woke up one day, Dan Plesak is my roommate, and my arm is like, is, my arm is like this, and I can't straighten it. And we tried everything we could, including putting it out on the little table we had in our hotel room, and he's pulling on my arm, and I'm pulling back on my shoulder, and it still won't straighten up. Four hours later, I'm purple from my wrist all the way to my shoulder. 85% tear. Uh, Dr. Job said, yeah, you need surgery. and Tommy John was the first one I had. And I bounced back from that really well. And 
So they send me the instructional league again. I sit out the year, but I go to instructional league. Well, I had done so much work on my elbow and I didn't have all these coaches telling me what I should be doing and not doing that I forgot to work out my shoulder as much. And so then I tore my rotator cuff up and he had to go back in and tighten all four of those. And yeah, just constant. I know better than the doctor. It's my body. I know when I hurt now, I feel good. And your immaturity. And I just come, okay, here's the deal. At 15, I'm the second freshman ever to make the varsity team in Florida where my parents live. Second ever. The other guy was on my travel baseball team. He was a shortstop. And he was the year before, and then the next year, it's me. And then two weeks after that, my dad said, guess what? You're going to live with my grandparents in Texas, which ended up being the best decision for me was to get away from him. So I go there. Our coach hates baseball. We don't have a high school baseball team. But we have a football team. And I played football, ran track, and played basketball. I played 10 games a summer in summer league. And so I'm falling behind. And I'm trying to pitch every opportunity I can to keep up my strength and everything, but I'm striking out guys who have hauled hay all day and they're too tired to swing a bat. And I think I'm good. I'm striking everybody out. Yeah, that mattered a lot. Wow. So uh, how accurate, how, everyone knows Hollywood juices up. Right. You know, they, they, you, you, I call it Holly, Hollywooding it up. Yeah. And there's a scene in the movie where, where Dennis Quaid portraying you, he's been told he's throwing hard. So he goes to a roadside ra radar stop and throws the ball. And I, I'm going, yeah, like that really happened in real life. Did you ever yeah. do that? Did you ever throw it against a... I, I did not. Here's the thing. The sign was there. And I taught okay. science, but I was not smart enough to realize, hey, you can find out how hard you throw right now. <laughs> yeah, right over my head our screenwriter saw it he put it in Dennis loved doing it and it let everybody know I had no idea how hard I threw till I actually got the tryout now that's a question I had when you're throwing batting practice or just you know working out testing the arm I, I would imagine that as you know a number one draft pick an A ball you made it to A ball as a young man yeah. And that's, uh, that is high level baseball in the grand scheme of things. Most guys don't get that far. You might, it occurs to me, you must have known you were throwing 90 plus. No, here's the deal. At the beginning of the season, when the kids and I made the bet, they can't hit me like at all, not even foul the ball off. Three right. months later, we're winning a district championship and I can't get 16 and 17 year old kids out. And I'm like, oh, I'm throwing really hard. I can't even strike out a 16-year-old. That's going to be awesome. And they kept telling me, coach, you're throwing hard. I'm like, I am not. They're like, my hand is bruised. And I'm like, that's because you don't know how to catch. <laughs> we had that relationship with those kids. And you know what? I've been yelled at, screamed at, and cursed at my entire life. And those people, words went right through my ears. And I thought, if I ever get to work, with adults, but let alone kids, I'm going to talk to them, not at them. And so we had a great relationship and I was kind of a smart aleck and I let them cut a pretty close line, but none of that crap happened during the game. And they knew how to act and they knew the only thing we we're going to say was each other and to build each other up. But in practice, I let it go a little bit because when you're more loose, you're able to perform better. And I wanted my kids to perform at the level that I thought they could. They just need to believe it themselves. So jump back 10 years prior at, uh, well, seven years prior. I had surgery at 28. I played college football for two years, team doctor, writing a sports injury book. All I'm doing is punting and kicking off. And so he follows me around the sidelines every game. Why'd you quit? Why'd you quit? Th You're still young. You still had talent. You still could have gone. I'm like, dude, if I roll over on my shoulder in the middle of the night, I can't go back to sleep. It hurts that bad. And then when he went in, he found a bone spur about that long that had a fork in it. And one of those prongs was inside my rotator cuff, destroyed it. Had to reshave the joint to make it fit. The other prong had destroyed my deltoid muscle so badly and frayed it. 85% of the muscle out of my shoulder. So my wife has to sit over here at movies because here is just bone. And 
you know, things that he said, you will never, ever pitch again, physically impossible. And so when the kids start hitting me, I'm like, yeah, he was right. And boy, was he wrong. Ironically, one of the first speeches I did after the movie came out was to orthopedic surgeons in Hawaii. And those are the speeches my wife liked to go to at the time. Des Moines, Iowa, not so much. Hawaii, <laughs> absolutely. And I talk and he's there. And I tell the story about him. I said, yeah, Dr. Ryan said it was impossible to pitch. So for the next five days, anytime I see a physician following Dr. Ryan, they're walking behind him going, oh no, it's impossible. You'll never be able to pitch again. And he took the biggest razz and I thought, guys are guys, it doesn't matter, man. Whether you're in a clubhouse or whether you're in a doctor's office, you get it if you mess up. And I love that. Whether you're at shortstop and you let one go through the wickets or if you're at the Mayo Clinic, if you mess right. up, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, another question I wanted to ask you is, and here's the gotcha question. Uh, okay. We call it, the call it the killer question. My introduction to Jim Morris was the movie, The Rookie. And uh, as soon as I found out you were coming on the podcast, I said, I got to see Jim Morris, the real guy. And sure enough, there are YouTube videos out of your yeah. pitching. And uh, you sported, I wouldn't say it was the Burt Reynolds, but you had the stash. Yeah. You were wearing the mustache. Now, when the movie came out, did, was there any talk of having Dennis Quaid mimic the stash? You know, he never talked about that. What he wanted was a scar on his shoulder. <laughs> I was like, all right, dude, but I'll promise you, you don't want to go through that. And, and it was funny because the night, we filmed three nights at the ballpark in Arlington for that scene coming in. And the first night, he's down in the Rangers bullpen playing catch for nine innings. And I walk, I just, dude, you will not be able to wipe your butt tomorrow. And he's like, no, man, I'm just having fun. I'm keeping loose. What if I fall down? I said, then it's a comedy. Who cares? But you're not going to be able to move. The next day, his arm is in a sling. And he's got a bottle of Advil sitting right here. And I was like, I told you. He goes, oh, man, that hurts. I'm like, yeah. How, how old was Dennis Quaid when the movie was made? He was 10 years older than I am. So I was okay. 35. He was 45. Okay. Man, that would hurt. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking from experience of getting up four times a night to pee, yes. <laughs> oh, you know, Mark, you got to throw in some uh, Chicago White Sox references here for Jim. Yeah, what was it like to strike out uh, Frank Thomas? And what were some of your most memorable moments striking out? What, most memorable uh, batters that you struck out? two innings against the White Sox the night I fell down on the mound. And warming up in the bullpen in Tampa, you throw from the right field line basically down the first baseline. And if you throw it past the catcher, it goes all the way to the backstop. And everybody in the stadium, all 10 people know that you did it. And I'm warming up and I swear to God, I throw eight pitches in a row that I'm not even close. And the catcher doesn't catch any of them all the way to the backstop. I come into the game and Durham is a leadoff hitter and I strike out the first four out of six guys I face or five out of six and everything was paint in the black. And I was just like, well, if that's what I got to do to throw good in the game and whatever, man. And it was just, it was surreal because I was so bad in the bullpen. I thought there's no way. And then I get out there and I'm just dotting everything. My slider's perfect. Throwing 98 on the corners and everybody's looking at me. And that was probably the most memorable game. The one that meant the most to me. And I lived in Connecticut when our all-star team, our, our base, our military baseball team got to go to Fenway and watch the Red Sox play Milwaukee Braves. Well, guess who was on, on that team? Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron signs a ball for my, everybody on my team. So the first thing I did living in Connecticut where it snows a lot was I sand lotted that ball. I had no idea that that ball would mean so much to me later, but the ball was ruined in 30 seconds in the snow. Oh and then years God. later, I am 
uh, Russell Athletics was an endorser of the movie. He was the lead guy for Russell Athletics. He and I closed the stock market down one day. We ring the bell. And I'm telling you my story and how much, why he is such a hero to me and getting to see him back then and not realizing as a 10 year old, all the stuff coming in from the periphery that he was being attacked every single day, letters and threats and still going out and being the hitter that he was at the level he was. To me, that's the most amazing feat I've ever seen in my life. And, but he just kept doing it. And so he was a hero of mine. And then get to close down the stock market with him was just a blast. He gave me a big old pat on the shoulder. He just laughed. He goes, I was going to ask you if you want an autograph, but you already ruined it. So I'm not giving you another one. He started <laughs> laughing again. That's a good just one. Great down to earth. Oh, yeah, the sense of humor. Yeah, baseball uh, players, you got to be able to take it, man. No thin skin. Well, going, going back to the movie and wondering how much of this, yeah, how much was real. Yeah. You're 35 years old. You're in, you, you rocketed through the minor leagues, but you're in the minors. And typically, typically guys break to the major sometime around their 24th, 25th birthday is when they make the move. And you're, you're the old man, your father time. Uh, and there was that one scene where the kid said to you, you know, the kid says to Dennis Quaid playing you, he says, you know, how, how many fans did you lose when they up the prices from 50 cents to a dollar or yeah. something to that effect? Yeah. And you're not as many as when you pitch and you get that, <laughs> that how, how, how much of that I'm sure that was real absolutely when I walk in it's the Orlando Rays double a team I meet them in Zebulon North Carolina to play mud cats or catfish whatever they were and I walk into the clubhouse and at this time the clubhouse was being built so the clubhouse was a mobile home and I walk in with my bags and this kid looks up and he goes, hey, we got a new coach. And I said, shut up. <laughs> and he, he giggled and I giggled and I went, yeah, I'm the old guy. They're like, we heard about you. You're crazy. And the first <laughs> night, my first appearance in, and I've not done this on a podcast yet. I come in with a guy on first. I coach and teach the game of baseball, high school level, college level. What do you think I did before I ever threw a pitch? The guy did a stutter step on me at first base. I bought. Yes, oh, and so I start laughing, right? And the catcher, he goes, time out. He comes like, what are you laughing about? And I said, I teach this crap. I just did what I told my kids not to do. So he starts laughing. Ray Searage is our pitching coach. And Bill Russell sends him out to find out what's so funny. And when I tell him, he starts laughing. He calls Bill out. And we're sitting there laughing on the mound. Umpire comes up. He goes, what are you laughing about? Ray Searage tells him in his lingo in the way he can. And the umpire starts busting up. He goes, all right, we had a good laugh. Let's get back to business. And I just thought it was hysterical because my kids would have been all over me. And, you know, so I pick that guy off. I strike out a guy. I'm out of the inning. Oh, very good. Oh, man. It sounds like a scene from Bull Durham. I know, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. They were calling me. I was Jim Morrison the first night I came in, and I was 30, 39. And I thought, you're making me older. It was fun, though. It was fun getting to be. If I would have got that chance at 19, I would have taken it for granted. You owe this to me. I deserve this because I want it. But at 35, having raised a family and seeing what life is really like and how hard it is and teaching and coaching kids, I didn't take anything for granted. I appreciate the chance to be a kid again for a summer. I never thought it was going anywhere. I'm just getting to be a kid again at the age of 35. And I love being at the ballpark. Well. Now, when you're a kid signing, you know, your first major league contract and heading off to instructional league or rookie ball, you know, dreaming of a ball. Right. And there's a there, there is a big learning curve. Guys in the major leagues are still learning. Right. Learning about release point, you know, 
I noticed that back you had what I considered the classic 1980s delivery with the over the head, you know, yeah. and, and now now they teach everyone to keep it compact, no wasted right. energy. You know, the, 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 the game is changing so much. Yes. But do you, when you came into the game in 1999, after having been away for so many years, you ever feel like, you know, you missed a lot of that, the, the finer points, the coaching that you would have gotten at the major league letter, le, level from major league pitching coaches? I think there's a lot I missed, but it was self-induced. I didn't listen to the doctors and I didn't listen to coaches. And I did things my way and I got out of the game real quick. There are guys with more talent than people in the big leagues right now, but they're sitting at home watching it on TV because they didn't do it the right way. You can't coach. You got to yeah. learn every step of the way. I, uh, I lived in uh, the city of Quebec City, which uh, has a professional team and an independent league. Okay. And what's nice about the small little ball yards is the bullpens are right down the left field and right field lines. That's so you, fun. you can, as a, as, as a fan, you can interact with these guys. And during a game against uh, a team from Massachusetts, Rockport, Massachusetts, or something like that, um, okay. I got I, I I was engaging with the catcher, and just asking him about his life, and he said he got in as high as double A ball, and then he was released, and he wasn't ready to give the game up, and so he found an independent league to play in, and he said because in the majors there's always some guy behind you. There's someone pushing every year they're drafting. You know, That's right. Someone pushing you. And if you're not progressing, you know, double A is kind of, if you don't make it past there. And I wonder, I wanted to ask you, let's say you hadn't had the arm trouble and you progressed to double A and you got to be 24, 25. And then they said, look, you know, sorry, Jim, you know, we've got guys in behind you. Best of luck. And would you, if you if you were not physically able to pitch, but had you been physically able to pitch? And I'm not but, leaving the ballpark. Okay. I'm so playing. you would have gone and played in an independent league? Absolutely. Or? I didn't want to wake up one day and go, what if? And so okay. absolutely, I would have stayed and played wherever I could. Baseball, baseball, man. <laughs> Great answer. Great answer. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about in today's game, they put the nets up. Have you noticed that? You know, like like around the fans. So it's, yeah. it's kind of a distraction, so to speak. What do you think about that? I think it ruins pictures. Exact, thank you. Can't take good pictures. I think if you're going to sit there, pay attention. If you got a kid with you, pay really close attention. I don't think we need nets, but on the other hand, we do because we have knuckleheads in the world. And <laughs> that's a good point. people get on their phones and they don't even know they're at a ball game anymore. And what's the point of watching on the phone when you got it right in front of you? I just don't understand that. But I think the Nets are a good thing because there are a lot of kids getting hit. And, you know, when a kid gets hit, the player actually feels worse than the parent does, if you think that's possible. And it crushes them. And it crushes everybody in a dugout, man. It's just like, oh, dude. Because it could be your little brother or little sister. Yeah. Well, in, in the movie, your son is played by the actor who went on to be Jake in yep. Two and a Half Men. Yep. Have you maintained a relationship? I don't know the name of that actor the, who played your Angus. son. Angus, yeah. And uh, no, yeah. he was young and yes, his parents were very protective of him at the time. And like dad was in a motorcycle gang, mom was beautiful and they have Angus and he's a great actor. And he was just very protected at that time. And he was just a little kid. I got along with Dennis and I got along with the kids who played my high school kids. And we oh, actually yeah. went when uh, the Spurs were playing LA for another time they won another national title when I had to watch but we all went to basketball games and it was fun watching all the the media come in who crucified people for 
having affairs and stuff. <laughs> and they've all got their lady friends with them who are not their wives. And, you know, we're sitting there giggling the whole time. I was also amazed at how tall basketball players are. When a whole team takes the floor, holy cow. And, but yeah, that and Dennis, my friend, the, the night that Brian Cox finished filming my dad's scenes, everybody gave him a standing ovation. I'm like, what's the big deal with this dude? And then I go home, he's like on every movie you could possibly imagine after that. I'm like, oh, that's who he is. He was the original man eater or Hannibal Lecter. And wow, what an incredible actor he is. But yeah. there's a lot of different, wow, in baseball, you have this melting pot of people from everywhere. But you get along because you're a team and that team has to be able to play as a team to win. And so you put aside your differences and you play as a team. And then when summer comes around and gets hot, you might have to put a person or two in their place and then you get back to being a team. On a movie set, everybody goes every different direction. And I was just very lucky to have Dennis play me because we would film all day and I would be out the set and then we would go in, have dinner, and then he would play at a little bar on 6th Street, and I'd watch the band play two or three times a night. And I would sit there watching him go, how do you have that energy? And he goes, Red Bull! And I'm like, all right, whatever. But boundless energy, man. That guy doesn't know how to sit still. And I know why he does what he does, because he's very artistic. Okay. Wow. I did not say autistic. I said artistic. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. We're not, we're, 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 what would you have done if they had pitched um, his brother as the actor? That wouldn't have flown. And let me tell you how we pick. They start telling me all these guys, right? And everybody thinks, who would play me? And they throw Brad Pitt out. And I'm like, I could look like Brad Pitt. That's cool. And everybody on my baseball team is like, if you let Costner do another baseball movie, we will hunt you down. And so he was out right away. Sure. Oh, yeah. And, sure, that makes and sense. Matthew McConaughey and Aaron Eckhart and uh, like 53 A-list actors. And they go, Jim Caviezel wants to play you. And I met Jim and his wife. I was on my way to New York to go to the Hall of Fame. And they were going back home. And when he walks by me on the plane, he points at me and goes, I almost got to play you, but Dennis beat me. So now everyone knows who we are. And I looked at him, I said, dude, you're way too good looking to play me. And then <laughs> wow. and two years later, he played Jesus. And I thought, oh, dude, you screwed up. Could have had Jesus play me. Yeah, but how, how many of those guys are left-handed? Uh, there were a couple, but Dennis, yeah, they were talking about putting mirrors up and reversing screen and wow. They can do stuff in Hollywood. I'm like, wow, okay, it works. And we actually had a kid from UT who was a graduate there who was a lefty pitcher who still threw really well. And he did the shots where the ball's not arcing. And he threw, he threw pretty well. And so you have Dennis in the windup and this kid's follow through. And it was fun watching it put together. My, my scene in the film, and I'm, up, I'm umpiring, so we're in... Austin, Texas, yes. filming a double A, triple A stadium now. And I'm the umpire. It's 155 degrees on the field. And I'm in umpiring gear. And if he throws strikes, three of them, everybody behind the film cameras get to eat lunch mm. and sit down in the shade. And so he's bouncing. I'm like, strike. He goes, I'm not even getting it there. I said, I'm helping you. <laughs> And so we start bantering back and forth and everybody gets involved. It was just a lot of fun being in that environment because personally, the guy from West Texas who taught and coached, that's a pretty unreal thing to be on a movie set and they're actually there because of you. And I tried not to think about that very much because even today at 58, I'll wake up and go, did all that crap really happen? I mean, it's just weird because everything was so fast and furious and like we're gonna do a bit we're gonna do a movie this is gonna play you and i'm just like okay really had no idea what all that meant until we got in the middle of it well, you, you are only the second major league player that i've actually spoken to the only other two that i've ever met face to face and had a conversation with were garth orge if you know who he is yeah 
former third baseman for the Toronto Blue Jays, sometimes second base. And the other one, and it harkens back to what you were talking about with Hank Aaron and what he had to put up with yeah. when he was chasing um, Ruth Saltheim home run record. I was in 1975 down in Vero Beach, Florida, watching the LA Dodgers in, Vero, in Dodger Town, Vero Beach. And Reggie Smith was playing right field for the Dodgers. And there was a uh, deliverance banjo playing wannabe in the bleachers who was giving it to Reggie Smith and wow. saying, you, you want some fried chicken, Reggie? You want some watermelon, Reggie? And, and the guy dad, probably cuts yards for a living. Yeah. Yeah, there. And, and Lasorda or whoever was managing the team that day, I was an eight, nine-year-old kid, um, pulled him out of the game because he could see that Smith was getting, it was getting under his skin. Yeah. And my dad, and, and back in that era, 1975, the player would walk out to his car so Reggie Smith gathered his stuff, left the stadium and was walking to his car. And my dad noticed and said, here, gave me a pen and a paper, said, go get his autograph. And that was the first conversation I had with a major league player. You're number three. And this is, this is well, I'm um, honored. amazing. I'm honored. Uh, and, and I wanted to ask, you know, as, as exciting as your baseball career was, short-lived, but spectacular what you're doing now is equally or maybe even more important because now baseball has given you an avenue to yeah. inspire people to help people you're you've written two books you're doing you you know you're you're speaking at corporate gigs engagements motivational Talk to us about, you know, since the movie came out, 2002, 2003, yeah. about this next phase of your life. Wow. Can I throw in a side story real quick? Go for it. In 2001, Absolutely. I signed a contract with the Dodgers. Dr. Joe told L.A. how good a shape I was in coming back from he and Dr. El Tarash tightening my elbow uh, in 2000. And so they signed me. I go out to Chavez Ravine and I'm either at Dr. Job's offices where they have all the scientific guys who help you get back into shape or I'm at the ballpark bunning, hitting, lifting, throwing, running, shagging and perfectly healthy. Everything is great. 98, 97, 98, 98. Five days later, I drive from LA to Vero Beach where they still had spring training and in five days, I'm afraid to play catch with the guy. I can't judge the ball being thrown at me. And I'm like, what happened? I teach kids how to bunt, how to catch the ball with the bat. I can't even bunt. They're lobbing the ball at me. I can't bunt. We're playing pepper. I can't catch a ball. It's bouncing off the fence behind me. I'm like, what, what is going on? And so I just, I got together with Dr. Joe and he told everybody my arm was hurt. It, old injury just happened but I was scared to death if I throw a ball up there at 98 and somebody like Stanton hits it back at me 120 I'm done and so I quit I go home go to the movie set but over those next 15 years some 70 surgeries later I get diagnosed with Parkinson's so I had the beginnings of that back then and just didn't realize in five days that light switch could just you're done with baseball and I was fine with that. Don't get me wrong, because I got to go home and spend time with my kids. And that's what I wanted. But what a, a road we went through. And that's what the second book, Dream Makers, is about. It's about rehashing the baseball and the kids at Reagan County all the way through our Parkinson's journey. And my wife being there with me every step of the way. I got to a point where I couldn't even button dress shirts anymore. And so she had to start traveling with me so I could do that deep brain stimulator. The pills weren't working, the doctors gave me. So as a person who has a doctorate in nothing, I thought, hey, if I had vodka, that might help. Because I would get a headache January 1st and I would have that headache and it would build steam until June 1st. 
And then all of a sudden it would just be gone. Then three days later, sinus infection, neck lockup, headache, all the way to Christmas. And so I had this thing. I go to the number one movement specialist in the world, Dr. Yankovic in Houston, diagnoses me with CTE-induced Parkinsonism, which quickly turned into Parkinson's. And I said, how do you prove the CTE part? And he goes, well, you got to die. I said, not really ready to do that, doc. And I um, fired him because I didn't like his bedside manner. And I go back to San Antonio where I live now. And I am friends with a great neurosurgeon who put in my DBS unit, my deep brain stimulator right here. And in 2020, the only time I ever had a surgery, I wanted an elective surgery. He took out the deep brain stimulator. I don't have Parkinson's anymore. I'm not gonna explain all that. You guys don't have time for it, but it's a faith-filled story. And it absolutely happened like it's written in a book. And if it hadn't happened to me, I would not believe it. And so my wife put something out on social media about Jimmy's been healed and it showed me running. Hadn't been able to run in 15 years and now I can run. And so I'm lifting, I'm running, I'm walking every day with her. 99% of the mail, we get back perfect. <laughs> that 1%, how dare you say you had Parkinson's? I watched my husband die. Wow. Okay. Number one, Parkinson's doesn't kill you. You'll get something else that'll kill you. It just slows you down a lot. It makes you want to sit by yourself and do absolutely nothing. If it can make you stop moving, it takes over your body that much quicker. And so <clears throat> talk to my marketing guys like, do not answer her back. And so we didn't. And then like an hour later, people who had written in talking about how great the story was, started taking that person on and going, how dare you perceive to know what went on in someone else's life? And so now the good people are taken up with the angry people and I don't have to say a word. Yes. And so that was thrown in all that. And where was I going with that? I was going to answer another question. Speaking. Yes. My agent at the time, my baseball agent, Steve Canner goes, you're going to be a speaker. And I say, you're absolutely wrong with a couple of other words thrown in. And he goes, no, I've already signed your name on a contract. I'm like, you did not. I will not show up. He goes, if you don't, it's your reputation. So I got the guy, Joel Ingalls, helped me write my first book, The Rookie, the oldest rookie. Yes. We drive to Dallas. I'm talking to major league front office soccer people. You have to talk for 45 minutes. I'm like, dude, my classes, I only talked for 30 and the notes were on the board. You want me to talk to all these people for 45 minutes? Mm. So I get up and I start speaking. Nobody moves, not a muscle. An hour and a half later, I'm ecstatic. Joel Eagle, the guy, book writer, he's ecstatic. We call Steve and he goes, you can never talk that long. If they want 45 minutes, make it 45 minutes. I'm like, you told me to talk, dude, I talk. And I fell in <laughs> love with that right then. And being able to travel all around the world and speak to people and get to see all the stuff I would not get to see as a teacher in a classroom in West Texas, that has been a blast. Getting to go to Rome, getting to go to Bora Bora, wow, Switzerland, yeah. and all these yeah. places, South Korea, with this speech, sorry, salmon dinner. This speech in South Korea, I'm talking to like 15,000 people and there are 26 different dialects. So everybody's got their headphones on and I have to slow way down so they can interpret it and pick up the humor because one group would get it and they'd start laughing. And I'm already moving on to the next thing. The next group get it and they'd start laughing. The next group, they're still laughing. I'm on something serious now. And so I had to learn how to speak through an interpreter. And so that was a lot of fun. Getting to go to Japan to open the rookie in Japan with, they love baseball. Oh, yeah. And so that was a blast getting to go there. We got, this is the only place I've ever been where if you tip, it's an insult. Yeah. And so I'm like, wow, you guys should bring that to the USA. Oh. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> but it was just a lot of fun getting to see all those cultures and be a part of something. Otherwise, you never would have gotten all because of the game of baseball. Sure. Now, one thing we didn't talk about much 
you talked about your time as a as a baseball coach coaching your team throwing batting practice and the kids no one being able to touch you and then shortly thereafter all of a sudden they're ripping you um but what about your time that you were a physics teacher which uh, uh i had a physics teacher try and tell me that a curveball is impossible um <laughs> What was it like being, uh, you know, leaving baseball aside? What was it like being an educator? I absolutely loved it. And getting to see the light turn on and they finally get a concept you're trying to teach them is cool. But the fact that they would come to me with stuff they only wanted me to know that they wouldn't even tell their parents. And there were a lot of kids I had to go, look, uh, mom and dad need to know. And you're like, I don't know how to tell them. I said, let's have a meeting in my classroom. And that's why the kids love me because they're my family. And unless a kid knows you love them, they will not break their back for you trying to do something you want them to do. And I know that because I was a kid once myself. It was a long time ago, but I was a kid and I know the people who screamed and yelled at me, I didn't want any part of. The guy who was in charge of our athletic program there hated my guts because the kids are supposed to love him more and they loved me hmm. and they just didn't and now i didn't care because they trusted me and so that's what i wanted them to do is trust me so that they knew if i can be trusted in the classroom then you can trust me on the field where i've been doing this my whole life and if i tell you something it's true i'm not going to try to tell you you're going to be a home run hitter when i'm teaching you how to bunt <laughs> and <clears throat> so they bought into it and that's why they came to the second tryout when I went back a second time for Tampa and tried out again in the rain. And there was so much stuff that was not made up. Even the director had no idea. And so as we're introducing the movie to Disney people and Burbank, he goes, and this part we made up just because we thought it would be cool to be throwing in the rain. I said, oh no, that happened. A brand <laughs> new baseball, every single pitch, sliding up to my knee in mud with metal spikes on and it's lightning outside. And I've got my kids who are eight, four, and one, and my high school kids holding those kids, and we're all out in a lightning storm in Texas. Oh, Jeez. I, th there's another question I wanted to ask about the movie, and it just I thought about it and I forgot, and now I remembered. And the question is this: in the movie that makes the point, you can tell I love this movie. There's a, a small bit where they talk about the fact that the in football in Texas, everything is football, football, football. And baseball is, you know, the poor cousin. Right. And the baseball field, the grass infield wasn't growing. And it's they had Caliche. The farmer. Pardon? It was Caliche. It was rock, Caliche. man. Wow. It was, it was white rock from sediment from when the ocean used to be over it. So basically busted up seashells for your infield. Wow. Okay. So I had to truck in dirt from Oklahoma and we redid all of it. So the, the bit about, they, they, you see in the movie, they, they had deer coming onto the field and chewing up the infield grass and the right. barber, but was that, was that Hollywooding things up? No, they actually told me that. And my kids, one of the kids' moms was a hairdresser and it's actually a woman who told me. And so we put hair around the field. No more deer. Oh, geez. And I wow. was, I was, I'm like, you got, no, you're kidding me. Because I couldn't figure out when my grass wasn't growing. I just spent all this money on grass seed and I got patches all over my field and I've got dirt and everything. Red dirt. It was deer. I came in one morning at, at five for a meeting I had at seven. And so I was going to turn the water on the field when I turned the lights on. Got about 80 deer eating grass. Wow. real this is uh fantastic now when the movie came out it did not it would the the reviews and i hate reviewers right it did not it did not review well i don't think there was a single baseball fan crit, movie critics have never have never played a game have never played an inning of baseball yeah. And if they did, they were less Nesman and WKRP. <laughs> right. Stuck, stuck out in right field. 
and how they could not enjoy this movie, but how did you react when you, you must have seen the critics? What was your reaction? Yeah, I got a notebook of every critic who ever wrote anything about it in a paper or a magazine. Wow. And I'll be honest with you, I got letters from all over the world, um, magazine articles and everything that I, anything I've ever been in. And I waited until I was absolutely done with baseball and the movie to look through any of it. And then I look back at it, and I'm like, that's funny. The year the movie came out, they debuted it in spring training and the baseball players absolutely loved it. Sure. And, you know, the only thing was Dennis is wind up as a little Yankee, but you know what, whatever. What was funny in the movie, they have a black guy coming up with me. And I don't think anything of it. Julio yes. Franco was actually making his 20th trip back to the big leagues. He was like 100 at that point. This guy eats better than anybody I've ever seen in my life. And I love Julio. He sat by me on the plane on the way into Dallas. He goes, you deserve this, man. This is an awesome story. And I thought, you've been playing baseball forever. That is cool. And you get a compliment like that from somebody. But the guy who got called up with me, who was that was supposed to be, was actually Steve Cox, big, tall, white guy from California. I think he hauled trees for a living. When the movie okay. comes out, where Tampa is playing the Yankees. So we're yes. walking across the field, and I see Steve Cox heading straight for me. And I see all my friends, African-American friends in the dugout laughing. And I mean, they're not laughing. They are hysterically laughing. And he walks up to me, he goes, Dude, you made me black. <laughs> Every player on that team was in the bottom of the dugout laughing hysterically. They were on the ground laughing. And I'm like, dude, I didn't have anything to do with that. What are you talking about? And he just looked at me and he goes, not cool, dude, not cool. <laughs> like, have fun with it, man. I don't look like Dennis and I'm not griping about it. Yeah. No. He, he was serious that he was upset. He, that he ended up being, they put him up to it. And so he's trying to be okay. serious. But ah. it's baseball. So everybody's getting yeah. a good laugh out of it. But I'm oh, yeah. about 800 media people and Dennis. And he's like, Dennis goes, uh oh, he's big. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I'm like, yeah, I didn't have anything to do with it. And then he starts giggling. And so, yeah, that's why politics needs to stay out of baseball because. Yes. Or any sport. I don't care. Sport is for sport. It's a game. Mm -hmm. These guys get to play a game and make a hell of a lot of money playing a game. Now, albeit they are the best in the world, but it's a lot of money to play that game. And yeah. for people to go to games and disrespect these young kids like they have is disgusting. And all because you think they think this or they think that politically. Think about how they hit. How did they hit in the eighth inning with the guy on first and two outs with two strikes? Yeah. What about that? What isn't that important? But it's whatever political cause you can pull up. I'm so tired of politics. I could throw up. I want yeah. it to be a game. I want these kids to have fun. They've been doing this their whole lives. They've known nothing else. This is the one thing they concentrated on. When I came up, you played every sport because that made you a better athlete. These kids have been playing travel ball since they were seven years old. They've known each other, even though they went to different colleges and stuff. They've known each other since they were eight years old. Hmm. And so they play each other continuously. Now they're doing it in the big leagues. And there are all these sons of guys whose dads I played with. I think that is awesome. Baseball is a great sport. Baseball is the greatest sport. Amen. I, 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 uh, I won't say I sucked at it. I was, I was an average ball player. But I loved the game. Um, there is a part in the movie, you can tell I've seen this movie, oh, a couple times, <laughs> where, and I, if memory serves, the, 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 the guy coming up with you, the guy who eventually made the, got the, call, the September call up with the yeah. expansion of rosters, in the movie is called Brooks. Right. Okay. In real life, he was and, Steve Cox. Right. Uh, and in the movie, it's depicted that Brooks is jealous 
of all the acclaim that you're getting as this 35 year old high school physics teacher. You know, you're getting the yeah. spotlight. I never saw anything like that. Everybody okay. treated me like gold. They thought I was cool, man. He's 35, he throws gas, that's awesome. I mean, they even named me Easy Gas because I threw so effortlessly. But I did that because the doctor said, you'll never pitch again. And I coach hitters better on the mound looking at them than I do from behind the screen. And so I wanted to throw batting practice so I could see their swings. And just different tastes for different ways of coaching styles. Yeah. yeah. What is yeah. funny was like the third day in the big leagues, I do an interview on the radio with Rob Dibble. Yeah. And he goes, hey, Morris, you've been hazed yet? I said, no, man, everybody's being really cool. He goes, I'll take care of that. Then I, I, then I forget about it. I'm like, okay. I go out and I pitch two innings that night. I think I get four strikeouts again, putting Tim Salmon on a 3-2 pitch, backdoor slider. All the Disney executives are there. And so that's cool to look good in front of them because they're doing a movie about me. That's awesome. I go into the clubhouse and my clothes are gone. Gone. Suitcase gone. I have a G string that says ring my bell and has a bell on it. <laughs> I have a bra. <laughs> I have a cashmere sweater and a long skirt, high heels, and a blonde wig <laughs> that I have to wear from Anaheim, California, on the plane to Manhattan, New York, and get off of the bus in front of the Grand Hyatt in downtown Manhattan at eight o'clock in the morning. But I got the oh, good end of the bargain because I was the teaching marm. All the other rookies were my students and they had mini skirts. <laughs> oh, I wonder if they could get away with that in today's era. You know. I don't know. Everybody's gotten this thin skin. They don't know how to laugh at a joke. You know what? I did a lot of stupid stuff and I'll laugh at myself all the time. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. If I'm laughing at me, why are you offended? <laughs> I don't get it. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked before we started the podcast. Of course, you were signed by the Milwaukee Brewers. And the voice of the Milwaukee Brewers is Mr. Baseball himself, Bob Euchre. Right. And boy, yeah, I used to love watching him, listen to him talk. Uh, when he Absolutely. Was being yeah, when he was being interviewed by Johnny Carson. Hysterical, and, man. And, and, and what, what I was convinced of was the fact that he was a third string catcher back when everyone, you know, a pitching staff was four men and five guys in the bullpen, and you could carry a third catcher. And right. who cares how good the third, a third string catcher hits? If he bats 180, who cares? He's going to get 20 at bats a year. And, and I was did. convinced. Yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> And, I, and the reason Bob Euchre stuck around in the major leagues for the five, six, seven years that he did, I'm sure it was just because, hey, I want that guy in the clubhouse. Absolutely, man. He could, he could put anybody at ease. And the fact that he had to use a crappy batting average, but a good teammate to get to be where he was with a microphone, what would we have missed if he would have just quit and walked away? I mean, that's baseball history talking baseball history he was awesome fantastic oh just just a, a, a hilarious guy and the stories he would tell on carson were just priceless go ahead mark i i'm, I'm well no I'm, I, was, I was also going to say with you with your uh time in the dodgers organization did you get to know vin scully that's another icon you know i did get to talk to vince and i i that's another one because my dad was in the military. Sure. And you could, you could see the Braves on TV from wherever you were in the country and you could yeah. listen to the Dodgers anywhere on the radio. Mm. And, and I love listening because you were there. Yeah. He took you to the game. And so I love that. The other thing I love with the Dodgers was meeting Sandy Koufax, who was an idol. Oh, of mine. for sure. And him shaking my hand and his fingers went up to my elbow. And I thought, you had the biggest hands of any human I've ever seen. One of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. But you know what? 
hockey players and baseball players, those athletes are the nicest and most polite out of any of the other athletes I've been around. Mm. And I'm not trying to throw nasty stuff at other people, but hockey to me, number one, those guys for beating the snot out of each other, they've got their act together and they know how to behave. The one thing they did wrong was invite a baseball pitcher who is in 18 games to Montreal, no, Ontario, to speak at a holly, hockey event when I've got hockey, NFL, NHL, Hall of Famers everywhere around me, and I'm talking about baseball. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Sports is sports. And yeah. Amen to what you said about hockey and baseball players. And I've actually had the same thought. And I think it has something to do with this. In the era that you and I grew up in, because you, you've only got, you've got a couple years on me. I'm 50, I'll be 56 this year. And um, hockey players, when we were growing up, 70% of the guys coming into the NHL were prairie farm boys who just grew up hard yeah you know, they grew up they grew up hard they grew up tough they knew and, how to work hard yes and baseball players unlike any other professional sport no one signs a contract at 18 and then goes straight into the major leagues it right. happens ken griffey jr you know it happens on very rare incredibly it's like one in ten thousand. right and so baseball players have to they have to learn their craft and they have to toil in the minor leagues for four or five, six, sometimes longer years. Right. And uh, that's why that that's always been my view as to why hockey and baseball players are, they don't have that chip on their shoulder that I'm, I'm everything in a bag of chips. Right. They, and they you're know what hard you're works about. Yeah. So when, when, where can we hear you speaking? Do you have any gigs coming up? Oh, pretty much off of the summer, man. The first part of the year was so busy with everybody trying to get back to humanity. And yes. in August, I did a deal in February for a group of leaders in Texas school systems for technology training. And now in August, a lot of those schools are bringing me in all over the state to do their in-service training for these new teachers they have coming in who are going to be working with kids and they want me to present to all these young teachers. And so, yeah, August, I think I do 14 speeches in 11 days. And then we turn around and we go to Bermuda and Oklahoma city and what cool stuff. It's good getting back out. You know, I think I started the COVID thing because on a plane flight one time I looked at my wife and I go, if we could just do speeches from home, that would be cool. And wow. then it happened. Yeah. So I'm to blame for everything that happened. <laughs> yeah. You're the guy. I'm the guy. And boy, do I know how to do computer speeches now. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you is what do you think about, you would have to say that baseball announcers have the toughest job because 162 games. It's a long season. You have to deal with it, especially nowadays with Twitter and such. Look at look at a yeah. guy like Steve Stone who announces the White Sox. He has to deal with, oh, the Sox are underperforming. The Sox are underperforming. You're a fair weather announcer. What do you have to say <laughs> about that? I think if you're going to get paid a lot of money traveling around, have fun with it. Yeah. Most of the people who are on the outside looking in don't know anything about baseball. Sure. Even though they were all stars in T-ball. <laughs> yeah. They don't That's know what me. they're talking about. And, you know, baseball is a game of attrition. Whoever stays healthiest the longest is going to win. And sure. if you're healthy at the right time and hit the right stride with everybody hitting, everybody pitching well, you got a chance to run deep. Otherwise, a couple of these teams, they get one guy hurt and they're, they're pretty much out of it. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I love about baseball is the people you can bring up that all of a sudden, well, we didn't even know they were ready for the big leagues and they lit the American League Championship Series on fire. And then you watch that career progress. And I just, it's a lot of fun watching it. I love hockey and I love baseball. 
Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you. Now, what do you think about uh, Pete Rose not being allowed into the Hall of Fame, if you don't mind me asking? I've thought both ways at different times in my life. My biggest thing with him not getting in was there was actually, just like that poster behind me, yeah. there was a sign that big on every clubhouse you ever walked into telling you to never, ever, 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 ever bet on a baseball game. It was on every clubhouse, every door. Okay, Everybody yeah. saw it. And you did it anyway. You got to take the ramifications. He makes more money than anybody anyway. He sure. goes up there and has his own story he sells stuff out of. And people love him because he's still the fire brand that he was when he played. Yeah. And so you get Pete Rose. Sure. And I love that because I loved watching him run the bases, the helmet coming off. And he was just Mr. Hustle. And But the Hall of Fame question, there are several guys I think should not be included in that. And that includes rule breakers. Sure. Okay. I, I see what you're talking about. I think it was sad that uh, Ron Santo was not uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame until after he passed. Myself. That's kind of sad. But at least for the relatives. Sure. They have something to bring back. Like earlier this year, the Red Sox had a thing for Jerry Remy. Hmm. And they got to honor someone who meant a lot to their organization while also honoring the family who were all in tears. And it was just very touching to me. I think baseball and hockey do that better than anybody. Sure. Yeah. Anything else you'd uh, like to add, Gordon? You know, no one cares about my opinion on Pete Rose. <laughs> well, what do you think? Honestly. Genuinely, what I think is Ty Cobb is in the, the Hall of Fame. And that man has issues, uh, you know, a filing cabinet full of them. And, and while I agree that he should have, I agree that he should have been precluded, but at this point, I would say, okay, Ex post facto. yeah, you've served your time out of the game, banned, we're letting you back in, we're going to enshrine you. Do you know uh, how many fans that would bring back to the game? Sure. People I would love that. thought about that. People would love that. Yeah, I have a maybe I have a forgiving heart. But no, I think I think that's the way too. But I know that when somebody asked me for, but Jim brought up a great point. The signs right there. You're not supposed to. I never thought about that until you brought that up. That's a very valid point. Yeah, it was there every day. We knew not to bet on baseball. He was a manager. I know he knew not to bet on baseball. But like Gordon said, it's been a long time and. You know what? Everybody else gets healing that's had their feelings hurt. Yeah. Why not heal baseball's wound and put in someone who absolutely deserves to be there? Yeah. If, if you take that out of the equation, he's first ballot 100%. Absolutely. You know, I, can't believe, I can't believe Ken Griffey Jr. didn't, you know, the, how many, was he one vote, vote shy? I'd love to know who that one guy was who, 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 who couldn't yeah, what are you? Someone with a jealousy stick up the rear end. Oh, that's all it could be. He said something wrong to somebody at some point. They probably asked him about going 0 for 4 with three strikeouts one night, and he said something offhanded, just like everybody does. And they probably held that against him. Yeah, well, I, I was watching. Uh, I, now the funny thing is with baseball, I love the game of baseball, but when it comes to Following the major leagues, I zero in on the Blue Jays. And Kevin Pillar, as hard-nosed a player as you could ever want to find, was yeah. up at bat. I think they were playing in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, against the Cubs during interleague play. And the pitcher on the mound slow pitched him or quick pitched him. He was yeah. doing the little, you know, he was changing his pace. And after being quick, I think it was a quick pitch. Kevin Pillar said something that I would have said as a teenage guy in the basketball court, football field, baseball. Yeah. You, you know, and in our generation, I mean, that was just something you said. Didn't mean anything. No, it doesn't mean anything. He, 
Pardon? It doesn't mean nothing. Yeah, he, he could have equally said, "Ah, oh, you jerk." That's what it meant, and I just right. can't get I can't get over the game. You know the way, but now we're getting away. Uh, Jim, if I want to order your books, I'm assuming Amazon. Are, are they available on your website? On my yeah, on uh, Amazon.com and on my website, JimTheRookieMorris.com, and we've got them and. You know, for 20 years, I tried to write this book and I had everything except a gotcha chapter. Well, there are two ch chapters in it. One is the faith chapter. And some people might be offended that I'm not telling them they have to have faith. It's what my grandparents instilled in me. And those are the lessons I carry with me through my family. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. I'm just telling you what makes me tick. The other chapter, because God has a sense of humor, man. Got healed of Parkinson's, and I got to do naked jumping jacks at 52 at a rehab center in Florida. And um, <laughs> it's not much worse than a 52-year-old doing naked jumping jacks to see if anything falls out of your body. Oh, yeah. oh! Th thank you for that. Thank you for that mental image. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh. Oh. Well, the books are called, for our viewers, the books are called The Oldest Rookie. And then in 2020, Jim wrote the sequel, Dream Makers. There, he's holding up a copy. And you can get them on Amazon or better than Amazon, because I'm no fan, personally, this is my own editorial comment. I'm no fan of Jeff Bezos. Go directly to Jim's website. We just lost a book. billion followers because he said that. <laughs> I, I'm joking. You get him signed if you go through me. Okay. No, we'll post the link to your website. So yeah, uh, they, they can... buy them from my website. I, I sign them before I send them. Outstanding. Awesome. Well, listen, we're going to wrap things up. I want to tell you how thrilled I was to have Mr. Jim Morris. The That's rookie. likewise. Well, thank and, you guys. I appreciate it, man. I love people. And who have a you know, if you for enjoyed, sport. yeah. If you enjoyed this episode of Mark 2.0, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to do the that? podcast. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can okay. go on all, all. You can go on YouTube. You can go on all the social media platforms. We'll have it out there. It's awesome. Uh, yeah, we really um, appreciate it. And Jim brought up a great point. You know, Phoenix is such a great area, but Nowadays, being 120, you're lucky you got out after spring training. <laughs> it's hot right now, isn't it? Uh, it says 105 right now on my uh, computer. So, yeah, and I think you guys are as dry as we are. That's not good. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks so much, Jim. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. If you guys just shoot a, a text or an email to my wife when the episode's going to come out, and yeah, we'll we push will push it up on our social media too. Sure.